Um, and y'all, please continue to remember everybody on our prayer list. And um, check on our shut-ins as often as you can. Um, because uh, a lot of them are in a lot of need. Please believe me. Okay. Uh, team one will will meet this Sunday, May the seventh, for a fellowship meal. Everyone's to bring a Mexican dish to share. Uh, as of just a few minutes ago, our our app has been downloaded 170 times, which I think is pretty good. Um, you can share this. I've shared it with a lot of folks that aren't members, and they uh, they seem to like it. Um, and one thing that uh, Barry's doing back there, he's trimming the ser each one of Matt's sermons, and I guess each lesson. Uh, and those can be shared. Uh, you can you can text them from the app. So, uh, and anybody that joins, that watches the app, the stream on the app, uh, is able to make comments and all like that. And uh, we're going to try to answer back if we can. Okay, uh, if there's nothing else, uh, Matt. Rather than repeat this a whole bunch of times, I'll just go ahead and say now that I did go to my cardiologist today to get my final report. And um, he said that, it, that my condition was non-life threatening. And so it's just annoying. And I asked him what restrictions I had. And this is the sad part. I'm not allowed to play professional sports unless I go on medicine. And he suggests I not bungee jump or skydive, lest I uh, have some adverse effects. So I can skydive, but I have to be tandem. So I've already, I've already broken the news to my mother that I will no longer be able to be a stunt skydiver. So uh, that was good news, and I give thanks to God for that. And thank you for all the prayers uh, um, regarding that. I, can still, I, can, I am now cleared to ride a unicycle. So... All right, we are going to turn our minds to Psalm 47. I was reading, actually, in the waiting room of the uh, doctor's appointment today, I was reading a book called The Chaos of Cults, old book, originally written, originally copyright dates, 1932, and then I was reading the revised version of 1948. Um, the man writing it uh, himself doesn't hold truth, but uh, he's pointing out the error of various religious cults in the United States and on one of these groups, he said that um, he's, I guess, considered an expert at the time on this. But he said he would get people asking the question a lot, and they'd say this. They'd say, why do they have so much zeal? Because they're out in the community. They're knocking on our doors. They're getting Bible studies. They're sending uh, uh, their, their, their newsletter all around the world. Um, in fact, uh, their second leader... At the time that he asked for it and was given it, he gave the largest radio broadcast in history by a religious group in the time that he, he, he was able to put it all together and figure it out and got all these radio stations across Canada and the United States of America to air him uh, uh, pr pronouncing their, their doctrines. And so the person says, so how is it that they have so much zeal if they don't have truth? And... Um, he said, he, I, he said, I didn't give them the answer. I gave them an answer of an older gentleman that I respected. And his answer was, there's zeal and there's fanaticism. And sometimes if you array yourself again and consider everyone, this particular group considers the government an enemy, considers uh, democracy an enemy, considers capitalism an enemy, considers everybody is evil. And so it's fanaticism. It is, it is the... the uh, we're the only ones right. And so his, his point was, don't, don't mistake zeal with fanaticism. 
sometimes that's a muddy line, and sometimes I think that might be, and I know that, that, that I've had a thought before about when I see somebody who's very zealous and they're, in a, they're, they're teaching false doctrine, but they're very, very zealous. I think it's a bit of a cop-out to say, well, they're just being fanatic. It's a cop-out because the truth of the matter is, regardless of what that, what that other person is doing, or regardless of what that other group of people are doing, it doesn't change the fact that I ought to be on fire for the Lord. It doesn't change the fact that, that the faith that I have in Jesus Christ ought to cause me to be trying to teach others the gospel, ought to cause me to be rejoicing in the Lord. Now, I want to read Psalm 47 together tonight with that thought in mind. And if you don't take anything else from this psalm, take from it the attitude, take from it the emotion behind the words. This is to the chief musician, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Oh, clap your hands, all you people. Shout to God with the voice of triumph. For the Lord Most High is awesome. He is a great king over all the earth. He will subdue the peoples under us and the nations under our feet. He will choose our, an inheritance for us. The excellent Jacob, whom he loves... God has gone with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises, for God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with understanding. God reigns over the nations, God sits in His holy throne. The princes of the people have gathered together, the people of God of Abraham, for the shields of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. They're excited about Jehovah God. They're excited about what it means that they are Jacob, that they are Israel, what he has apportioned and allotted to them because they are Israel. And what I would suggest to you is that all the zeal that they would have about being physical Israel, we should have more than that in being spiritual Israel. We if you go back through that text just quickly and you notice he says, shout with the voice of triumph, we have a greater triumph than they have. Their triumph is over physical nations. Our triumph that we have is the victory that Jesus Christ won over the devil when he went to the cross and won the victory over death. And so we have a greater triumph about which we should be shouting. He said the Lord Most High is awesome. That's true, and we know more about that Lord than even they did. We have more revelation than they did. He says he'll subdue all peoples under us and the nation under our feet. We have something far greater than that. Our victory isn't over other nations. Our victory is over sin. Our victory that he gives us, not that we earn, but that he gives us is not over our neighbors, but over the devil himself and his influence. He says he'll choose an inheritance for us. Their inheritance was the promised land. Our inheritance is better than that. They had a physical promised land. We have a spiritual one. We have the inheritance of heaven. He says the excellence of Jacob whom he loves. We are spiritual Jacob. We notice when you see Jacob, you're talking about Israel. We today are spiritual Israel. And he loves us especially the way that he did them then. And he says... Um, he says over and over again, sing praises, sing praises, sing praises. And he says, God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with understanding. When they sang praises with understanding, the praise they could sing with understanding is God is great and he will deliver us with the Messiah. We can sing praises better than that. We can sing praises that God is great and he has delivered us through the Messiah, Jesus Christ. We live on this side of the cross. Understand, when you read the psalm, they lived on the other side of the cross. They didn't know Jesus. Jesus had not yet come. They had only the promise of the coming Messiah. When we come together in this place and do what we're about to do, when we sing praises to the God of heaven, we sing the praises to a God who has already won the victory, a God who has already delivered us, um, and we can sing them with understanding. He says God reigns over all the nation, over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. You and I know something even more than that. We know that not only does God our Father sit on his throne, but that Jesus, our Messiah, and not only our Messiah, but our mediator, the one who goes between us and the Father, that he sits at the right hand of the Father even today. The prince of the peoples have gathered together the people of God of Abraham. 
For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. The message is this. You can read the emotion in that. You can read the joy in that. You can read the, the, the idea that we're to extol and to have great joy and to have great fervor in our love for God and our praise for God. And, and brothers and sisters, what I would extend to you as our midweek thought is this. If we don't not just match, but supersede that zeal, then the problem is not with the gospel. And the problem is not even with the doctrine. If I look around me and say, someone who teaches something that's not true has more zeal than me, the problem is not my doctrine. The problem, very likely then, is my heart. I can know the truth, and I can ritualistically go through the truth step by step, going through the motion, some people call it, and it will do me no good. God doesn't want me to one day decide I'm going to join up and I'm going to join a church and sit in a pew. God wants me to give my heart to Him. God wants me to praise Him. God wants me to love Him. And God wants me to acknowledge that the Son his son, Jesus Christ, dying on the cross had meaning, not just for me to be saved, but that the world might be saved, that my neighbor might be saved, that the person who checks me out of the grocery store might be saved, that my enemy might be saved. And if I'm not living that way, then our midweek thought is this, if I'm not living, if I'm not rejoicing in the Lord, then it's time to sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart with myself and maybe with someone that I trust and love spiritually to help me figure out what's going on there. If I'm not rejoicing in the Lord, then something is wrong in my heart. And I need to address that. I told you I got my heart report today. It's a scary thing to walk into a heart report because if they say your heart's broken... Oh, well, that means I'm going to die. Maybe not today, but that's not a good news. Brothers and sisters, heart disease will kill you physically. But understand this, heart disease will kill you spiritually. I've got to give my heart to the Lord. I've got to love him with all my heart. I've got to rejoice in him with all my heart. And then that kind of love and that kind of enthusiasm is what will drive me to be a person with great zeal when I exit these four walls. That's our midweek thought. I thank you for the time you take and attention to that, and I pray that you'll prayerfully give consideration to it. At the, always on Wednesday nights, and really any time we get together, we always extend the Lord's invitation. Understand this, this is not our invitation. Some people say, well, this is what the Church of Christ teaches. Look, the Church of Christ is merely the body of people who are trying to follow Jesus Christ and are, are, and are living in, a, in, in accordance with the New Testament uh, teaching of the church. That's all. We don't have a doctrine. If what I'm about to say is not in the scriptures, then reject it. Here it is. If you want to be saved from your sins, you've got to hear the word of God. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you want to go to heaven, you've got to hear. You've got to believe that Jesus is. John 8, 24. Therefore, I said unto you that you will die in your sin. For if you believe not that I am, you will die in your sin. If you want to be saved and you want to go to heaven, you've got to confess. Excuse me, you've got to repent and confess. You've got to repent, Luke 13, 3. Uh, Jesus said, no, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And you've got to confess Jesus Christ, Romans 10, 10. For with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. If you want to be saved from sin, you've got to be immersed in water for the remission of your sins. Acts 2.38. The people that were standing there that day, some of them had been the ones who shouted, crucify him, crucify him. And they said in verse 37, what shall we do? When they found out they killed the Messiah, they said, what shall we do? And Peter answered like this, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever been immersed in water for the remission of your sins? Have you ever been baptized for the remission of your sins? If you haven't, the invitation is open to you tonight. It's open anytime. But what better time than right now among people who are, will rejoice with you, among people who will help you?
to put on Christ in baptism. Or perhaps if you've wandered away and you want to come home, we're here for you, we'll pray for you. Or maybe for you, it's just that you're suffering. Life is hard and you want our prayers. We'll pray for you. We love you. If you have a need and you're online, let it be known online. If you're in person, you can come sit on one of these front pews while we stand and while we sing this song. blessing you have bestowed upon us. We thank you most of all for your son Jesus Christ who gave his life on the cross that our sins will be forgiven. And we thank you for the church that your son purchased with his own precious blood. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless the church, bless all the churches of Christ throughout the world, especially the congregation here at Edgewood. We pray, Heavenly Father, as we study your divine word tonight, Heavenly Father, that we'll leave him with a better understanding of your word. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you will forgive us for our sins, blot those sins from your memory, and help us to live our lives as Christians should. In your Son, Christ Jesus' name, amen. amen. state one that's the state that all of us are in right now we're still in the world of course that's the physical realm and then we talked about the second state torment and the third state paradise or abraham's bosom and now we're coming up talking about the judgment in the last day the coming second coming of our lord we're in first corinthians chapter 15 and if you'll go to the third slide that has 1 Corinthians 15, 29. We're going to start there tonight. And that's going to be our basic lesson text for tonight. And Lord willing, Lord willing, next week I want us to finish 1 Corinthians 15 and some ancillary verses to deal with that. And Lord willing, then we'll have two more Wednesdays in this month because the fifth Wednesday will be the singing service. And try to get through the five states of man in the next week class sessions, Lord willing. But the first Corinthians 15 is so important because it's the hub of the Bible. And you remember, there were those in Corinth who were baptized believers who were denying that there was a resurrection. And if that be the case, then it would be no point in being a Christian. 
If that be the case, there would be no need for the apostles to do the things they did, suffer the things they suffered, if Christ be not rose. I appreciate the lesson that Matthew had a moment ago with the devotional. It reminds me of the old, out, out, old saying, one brother asked another, said, what do you think is the biggest problem in the church, apathy or ignorance? And you know what he said, I don't know and I don't care. You know, sometimes people get all excited about things in this world. It might be a ball game. It might be this. It might be that. I know one time some preachers got all excited about selling Bibles because they thought they could get some money out of it. I know a member of the church who sold vacuum cleaners. There was such a markup between what it cost him and, and what he was selling it for. He had so much wiggle room. For example, he would go into a woman's house and he said, I'll give you $100 credit for your old vacuum. Now keep in mind, this is in the 50s. She might say, well, I don't have a vacuum cleaner. I've been using my old broom. Well, I'll give you $100 for that. He wasn't, he wasn't giving her $100. But see, people get excited. I can make some money this. Or my ball team is on top right now, but guess what? We're not going to stay there all the time. But why can't we really get excited about the truth in a good way and be zealous in the good works and do what the Lord says for us to do. Now keep in mind, those in Corinth were denying the resurrection. And let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29. We're going to look at a chart and then we're going to look at four arguments, possible arguments, if we have time tonight, from the Apology Express Defending the Faith Study Bible and men like Jeff Miller and his daddy Dave Miller had a part in that, Kyle Butts and Eric Lyons, and those, we know how, how good those folks in Paul James Press are. But let's look at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 29 to start with. Other, other, otherwise, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? Now the next chart. Baptism for the dead. Back to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 29, by Brother Bob Whitten. And let's just preview this chart. And this is under the assumption that what Paul had in mind here is an argumentative ad hominem. In other words, Brother Kaufman thought that's the meaning of it. And Apologetics Press writers gave that as a possible meaning of what Paul was talking about here that wouldn't violate Scripture. But let's just, for a sake of argument, say that. Paul was using an argument at hominem where some were saying that they were baptizing for the dead. And Brother Kaufman said, no, there's nothing known about that until the second century. And we know about the Mormons who have practiced that. In other words, someone has died and, and they'll be baptized by proxy and, and that supposedly will save that dead person. And then the Mormons have this idea of sealing someone to themselves, that they might seal a dead relative to them somewhere or another, some sort of spiritual connection, not found in Scripture. But let's look at the outline real quickly, then we're going to look at the various points. New Testament baptism, notice repentance is required. Baptism for the dead, no repentance. New Testament baptism, washing. Baptism for the dead, body of the recipient is not washed. Baptism in the New Testament, baptism on one's behalf for the dead, baptized on another's behalf. Baptism in the New Testament, a living person is baptized. Yes, they're dead in sin, but a living person is baptized. The dead person is not even immersed. And then faith is required for New Testament baptism. No faith required to baptize on behalf of a dead person. And then we'll talk about this last point in a little more detail as we get to it. One time action. And living person could be baptized more than once for any particular, for more than one person. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we get that part of the lesson. Now the next slide. New Testament baptism requires repentance. Baptism for the dead, no repentance. Person is dead. What, how can they repent of anything? I think get this in mind. Hebrews 9, verse 27. It's the point of man wants to die, but after that, the judgment. Okay, look at this. Look at the verse. Next slide. Acts 2, verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, 
And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's been said numerous times. And if you watch the video I, I posted today and the Edgewood Encourager about what must it be saying by Brother Don Blackwell. He had a little situation Monday night. Thankfully, he's okay. His wife has had a few little injuries. They had a flat tire and it was a long night for them. But he was talking about the fact that more people than not will deny that baptism is essential to salvation. But let's look at that verse one more time. Acts 2, 38. Then Peter said them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall see the gift of the Holy Spirit. A personal repentance is required. Look at Acts 17 and verse 30. Next slide. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Now let's reason together, say the Lord. In light of the fact that all this sin has come for the glory of God, Romans 3, verse 23. In light of the fact that the gift of God is eternal life of Jesus Christ our Lord, but if we die outside the Lord, eternal damnation, who are these are to do? Who are, to, who are to repent? Every one of you commands all men everywhere to repent. That kind of reminds me of it was either Brother Gus Nichols or Brother Marshall Keeble one talked about the Lord said, go to all the creatures. He said, I'm a preacher and I need to obey the gospel. All of humanity, all accountable folks need to repent. A dead person can't do that. Second, the next chart. New Testament baptism was and is a washing, not to put away the filth of the flesh, 1 Peter 3, verse 21, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. But baptism for the dead, the by the recipient, is not washed. They will look like they're already in the grave. But let's look at what the record says. Next slide. Ephesians 5, 26 and 27. That he might sanctify and cleanse her, that is the church, with the washing of water by the word. He might present to her himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Now again, let's think about if a person has already died, they can't repent, they can't confess, they can't express faith in Christ, and they have reached the point of any other thing being done on their behalf. You remember the rich man? He wanted the ladders to come back and just go to his brothers. That couldn't happen. You remember we, a few weeks ago, the rich man said, just give me one drop of water. That's not too much to ask, is it? But it, it's not possible. Next slide, Hebrews 10, verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having a heart sprinkled from evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. I want to borrow again on something Brother Don said in that lesson, then we'll go to the next slide. He was talking about sometimes a person is baptized into Christ, say on a Sunday morning, and they don't come back Sunday night, they don't come back Wednesday night, and they don't ever come back. Some have the idea that once baptized, that's all you need to do, but it's a continuing cleansing. We've got to walk in the light as is in life, verse 1, one verse 7. And let's go to the next slide now. New Testament baptism, we're baptized on our own behalf. But the baptism for the dead is baptized on behalf of another. Let's look at a few verses. Next slide. Acts 2, 38 again. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Did Peter, through the Holy Spirit, say, well, all of you who believe that Christ really died, really was buried, really rose again the third day, all of you who believe that baptism is essential salvation, you do this, you repent, and you be baptized for remission of sins, and you see the gift of the Holy Spirit. It was an individual process. You know, later on, they that gladly received his word were baptized. Isn't it sad that on Pentecost, 
It's estimated two to three million people. We don't know how many Jews were there. But we do know this, all did not hear and obey the gospel. And we said this many times. Or if we could just have preachers like Gus Nichols and Marshall Keeble and James Watkins around again. We've got some just as good today, Lord, uh, brethren and friends. But here's the point. Jesus, the greatest preacher ever lived, how many were gathered? About 120 on the day of Pentecost who had stuck with him. It's not a lack of preaching as far as the ability concerned. If we preach the old Jerusalem gospel, which is God's power to save, Romans 1 verse 16, doesn't matter who the human instrument is, it's the word of God. And yet along that line, though, people will become followers of men. And how many times you ever heard someone say, you're talking to them about the gospel, and they say, well, oh, brother so-and-so were there, He's got five or six degrees from this seminary and that seminary, and he tells me all I've got to do is say the sinner's prayer. Where's it found in Scripture? Then another lie the devil holds to is once saved, always saved. You don't have to continue to walk in the light. She is in the light. You don't have to be faithful unto death, Revelation 2 10. That's ridiculous to be faithful even if it's your death. That's what the Word of God says. Let's go now to the next verse. Acts 22, verse 16. And now, why are you waiting? Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Another lie that the devil tells is that it's as long as you're sincere, you're saved. Don't you think Cornelius, a centurion, when he was a praying man, an almsgiving man, he was thought well up by the Jews. Don't you think he was sincere, but he was sincerely wrong? Don't you think the Ethiopian treasurer was sincere as he made that long journey to Jerusalem and he's coming back in that chariot reading from Isaiah the prophet? Don't you think he was sincere, but he was sincerely wrong? Don't you think the apostle Paul, and he says, I did this in all good conscience, committing men and women to prison, but he was sincerely wrong. And again, the record says, and now why are you waiting Arise, be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Next slide. New Testament baptism is a living person is baptized. Baptism for the dead, the dead person is not baptized. Let's go back. Next slide, Mark 16, 15 and 16. He said to them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's where the creature came, comes in. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now, before we go to the next point, sometimes people will say, well, in your church, it's not our church, it's the Lord's church, instead, but in your church, uh, you, you call your, your, your minister a preacher, and you call your leaders elders, yes, but then they say, but in our church, we call our preacher the pastor. That's an unscriptural use of a scriptural word. Uh, we have deacons overseeing our church, quotation marks. You see how it goes back to doctrine does make a difference. Just like believing and being baptized are essential to salvation. The gospel plan of salvation includes hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized, but it also includes remaining faithful to the Lord. All right, next slide. New Testament baptism. We've we kind of touched around this already, but faith is required. Baptism for the dead, no faith is required. A dead person has no faith. They can't have any faith. All right, let's go back next slide, Mark 16, 15, and 16 again. He said to them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Faith is required for someone to be baptized into Christ for remission of sins. Next slide, John 8, verse 24. Therefore I say to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Now, let's back up for just a moment before we go to the next slide on this point. Here's a person, Joe Jones. Let's pick on Joe Jones again. He, he died, let's say, in the first century. 
And a brother in Corinth is going to be baptized on Joe Jones' behalf. But notice again, though, Christ said, If you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And back to Hebrews 9, 27, appointed man wants to die, and after that, the judgment. Joe Jones has no hope after the grave. The rich man had no hope after the grave. And his brothers would have no hope after the grave if they didn't make things right before it was too late. Let's go to the next slide, Hebrews 11, verse 6. Now notice, this would eliminate someone who, as one fellow says, has assumed room temperature. Hebrews 11, verse 6. But without faith it is impossible to, believe him, to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Think about this, diligently seek him. Brother Jim was telling me about a very beautiful piece of music that was composed by a German composer many years ago. Don't you imagine unless that fellow was just extremely talented that it took him a while to put that work together? And notice again what Hebrews 11, 6 says, But without faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must be that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Heard a story the other day about a former college football player, and I won't name his name, but one of his assistant coaches said that this young man wasn't even on scholarship at this college, but he was the first one to practice every day, and he was the last one to leave. That young man was diligent in his preparation, and he became quite successful in not only football, but also in baseball. Diligence, those who diligently seek the Lord, they will be pleasing in His sight. Next slide. We touched on this a moment ago. New Testament baptism, a one time act, baptism for the dead. Any one person might be baptized numerous times for the supposed benefit of the dead. Now, before we leave this point and go to the Apology Express outline, When a person in the New Testament was baptized into Christ for remission of sins, that's all they need to do is for one baptism. Now, we've all heard stories, and, and I know of at least one person I baptized again when we had gone to that gospel meeting that night, and the preacher was talking about baptism, and as we got back, he said, you know, said when I was baptized about 12 or 13 years old, he said, I just did it because a bunch of my friends were being baptized. And he said, I think I need to make things right, and so... Uh, his daddy was a preacher, and after we, I took him and baptized him, then he woke his daddy up and told him what he had done. His daddy was so tickled. But this is not what we're talking about here. This is one person baptized, bab being baptized over and over for the supposed benefit of numerous people. You know, a, a person, if, if that's what they were doing, and it's unscriptural, if that's what they were doing, though, for example, one person in Corinth could be baptized 25 or 30 times, but it wouldn't affect the dead person one bit. Now, let's go back to this just a moment. In Acts chapter 18, we find Apollos in Ephesus, and he's preaching only the baptism of John because that's all Apollos knew. Now, Aquila and Priscilla, they come in contact with him. To their credit and to his credit, they, they get him aside. And as the record says, they taught him the way of the Lord more correctly. And then Apollos started preaching New, Test New Testament baptism that point on. But here's what happened, though, in chapter 19. Apollos goes to Corinth. Here comes Paul to Ephesus. Paul runs into about 12 disciples who knew only the baptism of John. He talked to them about the Holy Spirit. They were baptized into Christ scripturally. And there was nothing wrong with John's baptism all the way to Pentecost. But when the church was established on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, then Great Commission, New Testament baptism became in vogue. So there's a difference between Someone who was baptized at a young age, and maybe they didn't know what they were doing. I've heard people, many of them have come out of the denomination and said, well, you know, I'm not really sure if I was baptized for mission or sins. I want to make it right. That's, that's one thing. But to be baptized numerous times in order to effect some sort of spiritual solution for someone who has passed the death, that is not possible. That's not found in the Word of God. Okay, let's go to the next chart. 
1 Corinthians 15, 29, and, and we've got on the, on the, the chart here, it's just, it's just, excuse me, the Defend the Faith Study Bible, <coughs> excuse me, Apology Express, and they gave at least four adequate explanations that avoid contradicting the rest of the Bible. Okay, first of all, next slide, <coughs> excuse me. These dead here refers to the old man of sin, Romans 6, 6, we'll read that in just a moment, Lord willing. We are baptized for the dead in the sense that we are baptized in water to eliminate the dead man of sin. Hence, Paul was asking why a woman would be baptized to eliminate, next slide, to eliminate the old man of sin, anticipation of in, eternal acceptance if the resurrection was not forthcoming. And now let's now next slide, read Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. That's a real problem. You know, back to Acts 2. Let all the house of Israel know surely that God hath made this same Jewish whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. They were cut. They were pricked to heart and cried out, man, brother, what shall we do? And they were told to repent and be baptized for remission of their sins. No longer a slave to sin. Next slide, the second possible uh, meaning. The second death refers to the world of lost souls. Those who are spiritually dead, they refer to the apostles, and baptism refers to the baptism of suffering that the apostles endured in order to make known the gospel to the world, alluded to in passages like Mark 10, Luke 12, Acts 9, 1 Corinthians 4, we're going to read those verses in just a moment. Thus Paul was asking why the apostles would subject themselves to the baptism of suffering in behalf of the spiritually dead people of the world if in fact no one has hope of the resurrection. Isn't that a great point? If no one has hope of the resurrection. Let's read just a few verses concerning what the apostles suffered. Next slide, Mark 10, 38, 39. But Jesus said to them, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? You be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So Jesus said to them, You'll indeed drink the cup that I drink with the baptism I'm baptized with. You will be baptized. Next slide, Luke 12, 50. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it is accomplished. You know, Matthew preached on this a few weeks ago. And you think about that in the garden. Christ's sweat became his drops of blood. Father, if it be possible, three times, let the cup pass, nevertheless not my will, but thy will be done. Look, let's read this verse again, Luke 12, verse 50. But I have a baptism to be baptized with, and am distressed. I am till it is accomplished. The Lord knew a whole lot more about what was going to happen to him than we could even imagine. You know, sometimes in this life we dread certain things. I remember those numerous eye surgeries. I dreaded that, but it all came out for the best in the, in the main part. In the main part, But the Lord knew what was going to happen. But he went anyway. He said, I, he's basically, I'm dreading this. Then let's look at the next slide, Acts 9 and 16, particularly about what the Lord said about Paul. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Then the next slide, and here is really where we see what the Corinthians were doing as opposed to what the Apostle Paul and other faithful members were doing. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9. For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death, for we have been made a spectacle of the world, both to angels and to men. One writer and I forget who he was, but he made the comment that in a figure, Paul is seeing the old Roman Colosseum, and he's seeing the apostles being fed to lions and to gladiators, and we know not all the apostles died in, in, in those ways necessarily, but they all suffered greatly. And Paul is saying, we're just a spectacle to both men and to angels now let's contrast what was happening and we'll go to the next slide just a moment the third possible uh, explanation think about this 
What was happening in Corinth? They were worldly. Paul's going to talk about those at the Isle of Crate in just a few moments. How worldly some of them were. They were known as liars. But think about the Corinthians. They had made an abuse of the Lord's Supper, made it into a common meal. They were abusing the miraculous measure of the Spirit. They were prideful. They were divisive. And Paul is saying, look, we wouldn't go through all this if it wasn't the reality that Christ did rise from the dead. And we wouldn't go through all this if men's souls weren't in danger. Yet again, think about this just for a few moments. Think about those. And the other day a man died who was 90 years old. I don't think he ever preached the gospel truth. He preached a lot of doctrines of men. But Paul didn't live and die for a lie. Paul did not believe that the Lord's body was stolen away because it wasn't Paul saw the Lord rose. And yet many today will not endure one single hardship for the cause of Christ, but they will fulfill the lucre's sake, they will for the praise of men, teach for doctrines and commandments of men, and they're drawing millions away. And we're not surprised at that because Christ told us that's what's going to happen, Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. All right, let's move on to, to the next slide, the third reason, perhaps, that, that, that what, what, what Paul is talking about here, those who are baptized the dead. <clears throat> and again, these brethren, Paul J. Express, not saying this is what is happening, but I reminded what Brother Guy and Wood said, this is the second hardest verse in the Bible to understand. He says, the third day refers to those who are baptized in water on the basis of the preaching and teaching done by those who had since died. In other words, who would a personal, why would a person obey, the next slide, obey the command to be baptized and thereby have hope of life beyond the grave if the one who taught the person to be baptized has since died and will not be raised from the dead. Now, you think about this in a very real way. Let's suppose, for example, some that Stephen taught and he baptized. Well, we know Stephen died. And what if some of those who were baptized by Stephen thought, well, you know, Stephen's dead. And, and, and I heard that some of those folks in Corinth are saying that there's no resurrection of the dead. And how are we going? No. Those who were baptized by Stephen and others, you think about those, Paul said he didn't baptize many. But those who were baptized by, say, the young preacher Timothy. And when he died and when Luke died, those folks who have been baptized by those men who were faithful Christians, they realized that, yes, I'm going to be raised one day. They're going to be raised one day. Then the next slide, let's look at the fourth and final possibility. And this is where that uh, argument ad hominem comes in. Paul was using the illogical argument known as uh, argumentative ad hominem, an argument based upon what men were doing at that time and with which the readers would be familiar. Now, again... Brother Coffin says that there, there was none of this false doctrine known being taught into the second century where, the, where one was baptizing for a dead person. But here's the point, though. We know there were division in Corinth. We knew there were some things in Corinth we didn't read about in other churches. But this is just a possible, possible solution. Paul was not condoning this. He's saying, look, there's some who are baptized because they know there's a resurrection. It's kind of like a couple of illustrations we can use. Think about a Native American Indian, and he's buried, let's say, for example, with his tomahawk and with his spear and maybe even with some, a bowl of corn. We can say, well, those folks were thinking about there's going to be a resurrection of some kind. You think about all the tombs in Egypt that have been raided. And to me, I, I, I don't care who they are, how long they've been there. I don't think they'll be raiding those tombs and disturbing those things, but you know, you think about it, you hear about some live people and servants and animals were buried with some of these pharaohs in the tomb with all kinds of food, what? Anticipating a resurrection. And again, they didn't have it right, but there again, they were thinking about there's some kind of life after this life. And so we need to tell folks exactly what that life is about and have them come to knowledge of the truth. Okay, it could be that the Corinthians were familiar with people who practice an immersion for the benefit of the dead. He used a third person, they and Brother Coffin used this same 
thought, they as opposed to you or we, New Testament baptism would have been uh, referred to in the first or second person. This tactic of referring to what outsiders were doing without implying endorsements to make a valid spiritual point was used by Paul on other occasions. And we're going to look at two verses and we're going to close in just a few moments. Look at the next slide, Acts 17, 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, we are also his offspring. Now, Paul was not endorsing everything this poet said. This poet lived in about 270 B.C. And his name was um, Eratus. And Paul is saying that even some who are not inspired know that we in, in, in God have our living and moving have our being. Now, think about this. In a general sense, physical life, every human being, atheist, Christian, way we're member of the church, dominationalist, agnostic, we have life because God breathed a man's nostrils, breath of life, man became a living soul. But in a special sense, in him we live and move our being because we're in Christ if we're be, be New Testament Christians. Isn't that wonderful? And then let's look at one final verse. One final verse. Titus 1, verse 12. He says, One of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. I want to read just one quick comment from Brother James Burton Kaufman. Our time is just about up. Next slide. No, I don't have that on, so I'm sorry, I don't have that on there. Cretans are always liars. History reveals that this was not an untrue judgment. In antiquity, the noun Cretism was a synonym, was a, a synonym for lie. One of the most famous lies was that the tomb of Zeus was located on their island. Now, what is Paul doing? He's left Titus in Crete to establish elders and secular history tells us that the Cretans were known to be liars and can you imagine the problem of appointing men from a place that was known to be liars and that certainly would not be a, a good attribute for an elder to have and so Titus had his work cut out for him didn't he but Paul seemed to by quoting these ancient prophets and again a man can be a prophet and not be a true prophet and he can be a prophet just in the sense of teaching things or telling things not necessarily a foreteller in the predicting the future for example but again we know this in conclusion no one can be baptized for another day you can't even take a, a live person and say well I'm going to baptize oh, my neighbor over here he won't be baptized I'm going to baptize myself on his behalf have myself baptized that doesn't work but what is just as ridiculous is faith only saying the so called sinner's prayer not found in the word of God once saved always saved and what's also just as ridiculous saying well just as long as you're sincere well sincerely wrong sincerely wrong how many times in this life on things that are not nearly as important as eternal matters have we thought I've got this right and you haven't? It might be figuring out a math problem. It might be uh, diagramming a sentence under Brother, Brother Curtis Cates. It might be listening uh, to lessons from some of those other teachers I had like Brother Barkley. And when he taught Greek grammar, I had to pay attention in order to to get anything from it but sometimes we get the wrong answer but what about the most important answer again Matthew a few minutes ago gave the gospel plan of salvation and whatever Paul meant in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 29 he wasn't advocating he wasn't advocating a living human being being baptized to benefit a dead person who's no longer in this old world Brother Henry, will you mind listening to a closing prayer?
Without time, 